morning, everybody. Um, welcome um, to our second uh, keynote speech of um, this conference in memory of um, Ole Havrilishin. Uh, it is an enormous pleasure that we have uh, Professor Marcus Kreb uh, kindly accepted our invitation to give uh, this uh, keynote. Uh, I'll say a few words about uh, Marco very, very briefly. Uh, so as not to give much chance uh, to technology. Uh, Professor Schreb uh, graduated from Zagreb University in the early 90s and uh, went on to the start of an academic career. Um, he uh, spent some time in, at the University of Pittsburgh in the, in the 1980s and uh, received his PhD. Uh, from uh, Zagreb Faculty of Economics in, in 1990 and started teaching there, but uh, soon um, was attracted by uh, the, the policy world and has become uh, the first paper in this conference was uh, about uh, people present at the transition. And uh, Professor Skreb is one of those that's not just present in transition, but made the transition. He uh, is uh, a very, very important and influential policymaker. He was uh, a, a fundamental governor of the Croatian National Bank, uh, created a forum of dialogue, which is the Dubrovnik Conference that uh, remains to this day. And uh, in my mind has uh, started uh, the road to the euro in Croatia that uh, is uh, now coming to, to a close uh, in his governorship uh, of uh, the Croatian uh, National Bank. Um, after stepping down as governor, he accumulated an enormous amount in, of experience and knowledge in, in the region, advising <clears throat> central banks uh, all over uh, at different moments in time in the transition, the Central Bank of Ukraine, uh, of Albania, uh, uh, Romania, Kosovo, uh, among the main ones. Uh, and it's a real, real pleasure uh, to have Professor Skreb today reflecting uh, in memory of Ole uh, on his experience and his thoughts on the EU integration and convergence. Marco, the floor is, is yours and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's still before noon. Uh, thank you, Laura, for your very kind words. Highly appreciated. Uh, at one point, I was wondering whom are you talking about, but thank you. Those are very nice, very nice words. Appreciate it. Uh, the first rule would say, let me thank the organizers, especially LOD, for inviting me to the conference, including others that took part in this. Uh, I'm using this opportunity to thank Oleg for the friendship, because were it not for him, obviously I wouldn't be uh, here as well. When LOD actually uh, sent a mail, I almost said called me, but we, we communicated by mail, sent a mail and said, well, we have this conference in the memory of Oleg. To be honest, I immediately jumped on the occasion because A, it was an opportunity to post-pandemic travel, which sounded very attractive, B, being in a live conference, which again is something that we uh, tend to again appreciate uh, with all the restrictions that we were supposed to do two years. But very soon I realized there is a very big challenge for me <clears throat> because this is an academic conference. I realized people sitting here have done tremendous work in a lot of papers, scientific papers. My chairman, Auro, when I Googled, did some very serious work on European integration with synthetic measures published in best articles. And as he said in one of my previous incarnations, 30 years ago, I did some work, but since then, I'm basically either policymaker or consulting other central bank, which believe me are very different skills than, than writing academic papers. So I ask you kindly to bear with me uh, for my speech, which will be without a lot of statistical data, no hypothesis testing, no models, and it's even so low tech that I even don't have a PowerPoint. 
Anyway, uh, to make sure that I did prepare something, I've sent paper earlier to Elodie so he, she can confirm that some homework has been done in preparing for this paper. Finally, as a last words of introduction, um, I needed to find a way how to, to make my thoughts uh, fit into this conference. The conference, as you know, is entitled Economic History, Comparative Economics and Policy Making in Transition. On economic history, um, I'm not sure Elena would agree with this definition of economic history, or uh, Thomas was talking about historical data, but I'm old enough to consider my own memories from 30 years ago, comparing them that this is something which I call my own history. Second, comparing what has been happening 30 years ago and happening now, that could be, well, maybe not with your students, but in my book, we considered comparative economics. And finally, policy making is something that I'm kind of accustomed to. So first, let me start with the historical component. Uh, the part of this I call a walk down the memory lane to the origins of transition. So it's kind of primordial soup, if you want to use those words in transition. We all know that <clears throat> transition in this part of the world, by this part, I mean South and Eastern Europe or Central Europe and Eastern Europe, started with the fall of Berlin Wall, 1989. Former socialist states, old and new ones, some, some of them were already states, basically started this transition from socialist economies to market economies one. Uh, market economy, market economies, apologies, once. EU accession started somewhat later. We know that the first wave of transition economies that joined the EU in 2004, with eight former socialist countries, plus Cyprus and Malta, which was the biggest expansion in EU in that period. Second wave was three years later, only Romania and Bulgaria joined in 2007. Actually, I was in Romania when this, this has happened, that was interesting. And after this, only Croatia, became member by mid-2013. Since then, there are no new EU members, so I'm talking about the speed of uh, accession, and I'm not sure that we will ha have new members anytime soon, by any time, I mean, let's say, the next three to five years, which is... What is interesting, and this is, I'm going to try to explain it in more details, for most of those countries, of course, they are, as I said, former socialists and people who were there, who lived there, who were educated in the old type systems. So they needed assistance in how to get to the market economy. Basic advice that was given, and I will say to us, to all of us, that because I was living at that time in Croatia, was along the principles, which some consider the term controversial, could be subsumed as Washington consensus. I'm sure you are familiar with Washington Consensus, is uh, actually the author of the term, John Williamson, often said that this is a misinterpretation, but I'm not going there. I will just remind you, especially younger ones, that this basically means that in a nutshell, what one should follow is fiscal discipline, should follow liberalization of prices, privatization of state-owned companies, deregulation of the economy to the extent as much as possible, especially liberalization of the financial system. FDI, of course, should be encouraged as much as possible. Customs and trade should be as low as possible to enable free movement of capital and goods. Uh, in terms of IMF terminology, first, the current account should be liberalized, and subsequently, we all expected that the full liberalization of capital accounts I know it may sound strange today, but that was some kind of a goal at that time. Interestingly, in the early stages of transition, even for countries that later, because I said 2004 was the first year, were, were given advice, most of the advice came from the International Monetary Fund to a, later, to, to a lesser degree World Bank, because World Bank was most more involved with uh, privatizations and so on. Very soon, and this is the town where this new institution was formed. EBRD was formed. And I'm always reminded that initially, when EBRD was created here in London, and it still is here, was supposed to have a limited shelf life. Once transition is over, 
And I remember we had discussion, EBRD was supposed to close down. Just let me make a brief digression. Today, EBRD is investing not only in Central, uh, Central Asia, Turkey, but a lot in Northern Africa. So it's, it's not Europe anymore, but we, we can talk about it later. So all advice was very consistent and was coming primarily from the IMF. Even when those countries joined the EU, um, my guess is, and that's a speculation, that Brussels, and at Brussels I mean European Commission, and later on when countries became members of the, of the Eurozone, those institutions really didn't have capacity, like the fund did, either to monitor, or we would say surveillance in the fund terminology, and really give advice outside the acquis communautaire and discussion on that area. When we talk about advice, again, let me remind you a little bit of history, <clears throat> that the so-called two-pack excessive deficit regulation for member states came into force only in 2013. So my point is that the early stages of transition, I'm talking early 90s, advice given to those countries were basically along the line of Washington consensus, mostly coming from the fund. <clears throat> Theoretically, I guess we would all call that this uh, <clears throat> neoliberal economic views, which again, if we go a little bit further in history, could be traced back to 17th century France and the laissez-faire, laissez-aller philosophy. Actually, I couldn't pinpoint who actually first said that, he, that, that expression, but we all know this has been widely used. Later on, popularized by Adam Smith, and this is what has been a dominant way of economic thinking, especially starting <clears throat> in, the, in the area which I will explain. Um, why is this important? <clears throat> because, as you know, following the Second World War, actually, slightly before the World, First World War, main economic uh, thought or the way how we should look at the policy making was Keynesian strong government intervention. Now, what has happened is that as a reaction, and actually it's interesting, Vito Tansi mentioned that yesterday, that he's writing a book, so we are looking forward to it. To a large degree, as a reaction to this strong government intervention, uh, what happened was first in the policy arena, the so-called Reagan-Thatcher revolution. I'm talking about the early 80s. So the laissez-faire came back, I would say, with a vengeance. So former socialist state, and that's my actual first point, planned economies, when they were liberated, when they started to think how to develop, they were in the flourishing of neoliberal economic views. That was their approach. So I will give you some of my examples later on, how we viewed that, that but that was the case. We may speculate what would have happened if those countries wanted to exit socialism when government intervention was much more popular. Would the advice be given to them the same? But I leave that, of course, for the discussion. Let me make now a digression. <clears throat> As Naura mentioned, my comparative advantages are in central banking. So I will refer to um, famous both economic historian, central bank practitioner, and, of course, um, first-class economic researcher, Charles Goodhart. Charles Goodhart wrote an article about history of central banking. And what I like, in, he wrote a lot about central banking. But in one of his uh, papers uh, on discussing 300 years history of central banking, he said, we have periods of what he calls consensus, when everybody agrees what central bank should do. And in between there are period, and I'm pointing this out, his expression, confused interregnum. The last period of consensus in central banking is what he refers to as triumph of the markets, which is basically from the 80s, I'm talking last century, until, of course, the global financial crisis, until 2008, uh, 2007, 2008, Lehman Brothers. It started in the US, but I still have the picture of people exiting Lehman Brothers in London offices on TV. So for me, Lehman Brothers collapse is, is linked with with this now. So this was not only consensus in central banking, but to a large degree was a consensus in economic policymaking. In US, that was called the period of great moderation. 
Some of you may recall that was a golden period for the famous, at that time, called Maestro, Alan Greenspan, who was a central bank uh, governor or president of the Fed for a long time, and his views were quite dominant. I can tell you firsthand, because I was, uh, when Greenspan was governor, I used to go to Basel, which is, as you know, sanctum sanctorum of uh, central banking, central bank of central banks in Basel, and whatever Greenspan would say, that was considered to be absolutely, absolute truth. Nobody would dare uh, question his views. Today, what he was doing in economic policy is considered Greenspan put because his philosophy was, we shouldn't burst the bubble ex ante in advance because we don't know what bubble is. Once it bursts, we just have to mop up the liquidity. Uh, I'm not sure this is the predominant view today, but certainly that was very dominant in his era. Besides that, he was very strong in saying that uh, big financial institutions would self-regulate. So we shouldn't regulate them. It was so-called light, light touch regulation. Hands off, they know the best, they won't harm themselves. Of course, we, today we know better, but I can assure you it's not just me who was new to central banking, but a lot, a lot of other central bankers and, and economic policy makers were what I would call intellectually captured and didn't speak truth to power. Even the rare ones who did, like uh, Joe Stiglitz, who was chief economist at the World Bank for a short period of time, his views were considered at that time quite controversial. What is interesting, it's not just the economic view that were dominant, this consensus in economic, but something similar was happening in political arena. Uh, I'm not a political scientist, but I'm sure we are all quite familiar with uh, Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History. So we thought this is really the end of history, east-west -west divide is over, and we shouldn't worry about those questions anymore. He predicted the triumph of the liberal democracy. I'm not sure if what are his views on what in Hungary is called now illiberal democracy, but we can discuss that later. Now, in my view, uh, all those views have been cemented by uh, globalization. So globalization is the way to go. And this, again, can be captured by, from what I can tell without scientific citation, one of the most quoted titles. And it's Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat. Probably Bible is more quoted than, than his book. But anything, anyway, uh, Everyone believed in globalization as something that will benefit, benefit everyone in the best way. Now, when it comes to personal history, I told you in the 90s, I came, as you heard, from university to the central bank. First, I was head of research, then became governor. What have I learned at that time from the institutions and advice given to us? I will point out five most important things that I remember. A real interest rates should be positive. What we were thought, in a very strong words, the only way to get optimal allocation of resources, if in your economy, real interest rates are positive. Socialist countries that fought with inflation had to increase them significantly to get them to a positive term. Point number two was avoid fiscal dominance. I guess most of you know that IMF is not really International Monetary Fund, that the IMF stands for, it's mostly fiscal. What happened? Because <clears throat> typically when IMF missions, even in, in the countries of transition, would go to a country, first thing they would look at the fiscal data. It was a little bit like the one of the last, last words, uh, last sentences in the famous Casablanca movie, uh, when Captain Renault when uh, Strasser, I think the, the, the name was killed, says round up the usual suspects. When the fund would come to a country, it was always round up the usual suspects. Who are the usual suspects? Fiscal deficit, public debt, and their dynamic. This is how you would look at it. Even if you think about later on <coughs> Europe and Maastricht criteria, I would argue that two most important pillars of the nominal convergence in Maastricht criteria are actually fiscal ones. 3% deficit and 60% public debt. 
uh, you may have different views and economic models, but basically, if you have fiscal, uh, fiscal accounts in order, then it most probably can follow that you can live with low inflation, which are the other nominal criteria, stable exchange rate, and long-term interest rates in line with other countries. Vice versa doesn't follow. If your fiscal numbers are not correct, then I'm sure you cannot have, or at least for a long time, inflation in order and, and the rest of it. So basically, stability and growth pact is a necessary precondition. Foundations, the fiscal arena is a precondition for single uh, currency, for Europe. That, that's the way it was viewed at that time. Third thing that we learned very strongly was that the only thing that is important is low inflation, preferably around 2% per year. We were all taught that whenever inflation is higher than that, that creates distortions in the economy and that should be avoided at any time. Even the most dominant, what I call modus operandi of central banks at that time was called after inflation, inflation targeting regime. So central banks should be inflation targeters. Even I remember, uh, and I still know the, the year in 96, that was one of our first meetings in Basel. At that time, the chairman of the Basel committee, Swedish governor, Urban Beckström, only half jokingly explained and saying central banking is quite easy. You actually have to remember four things. First num things, number one, inflation, it's always too high. Point number two, interest rates, always too low. Point number three, if things go badly, blame it on the finance ministry, IMF problems. And point number four, if things go well, well, that can be uh, attributed only to the good behavior of the central bank. So that was how they envisage, how, how the view on central banking at that time was viewed. A couple of things I remember because I was central bank about monetary policy. Rule number one, monetary policy should be sector neutral, meaning you shouldn't prefer one sector of the economy over the other. Some of you may be familiar, in socialism, central banking was, we had so-called selective credits for agriculture, for industry, you're trying to subsidize some sectors of the economy. Point number two should be no government financing. That's a blasphemy if you give money to the government. Point number three, monetary policy should be forward-looking because there are times in Time lag in monetary policy, what does it mean? From that time, actually, earlier, there is this proverbial punch bowl. You know the story that the central banker should take the punch bowl out of the party just when the party gets heated, because if it stays there too long, then the party will be overheated. If you add to this uh, sentence by Milton Friedman, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, you have a pretty good picture how we were educated to conduct the monetary policy. I will be brief on other policies, but you know, free trade policies, as low tariffs as possible, global supply chains. There was this principle that you should buy your supplies wherever they are cheaper. The, the, the how would say, the mantra of, of um, eliminating stocks were just in time just in time work, so you don't work with, with stocks, you just have your pieces for your car. The very day you need to put them in a machine in, 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 um, in the factory and then you roll it over. This is how the world lo looked like. Actually, in a nutshell, there was a quite consistent set of economic policy advice combined with theoretical and I would say worldviews, ideological worldviews, so Reagan Thatcher revolution and all that. And this was applied to a large degree to transition economies. I guess the logic was, if it works for the US, it should work for transition economies. If you want to increase our standards of living, then this is the way how you should, you should do. Actually, you may remember at that time, uh, there was a very popular uh, tidal wave theory. If rich gets richer, they will bring all the elements of the society with them, so taxes should be lower. I'm referring to the Laffer curve and so on. And this will bring all of us and we will live happily ever after. Even a lot of economists would call that period Goldilocks economy. But as we know, 2000, 2007, 2008, 
the fairy tale came to an end with a lot of crying for those who had too much invested. Okay, so much for history. Now I'm trying to put my head as a comparative uh, economist. Of course, this is not comparative in the way you use that term. And let me follow, it's going to be an intertemporal comparison. So I'm comparing what I described to you, which was 90s and a little bit later, to the way I see the world today for numbers. Hey, I had a look at ECB webpage a week before I came here. And you know the numbers, but let me read them for you. Deposit rate minus 0.5%. I'm talking nominal rate. Main refinancing operation 0%, which means you can get money at zero interest rate. Marginal lending facility 0.25%. Inflation in May 22 in Eurozone 8.1%. So much for real positive interest rates. Point number two by the end of 21, Eurozone fiscal debt on average was 95.6%. You don't need sophisticated math to know that it's far above the 60%. EU on average would sound better, 88%. The fact is that transition economies, with the exception of Croatia and Hungary, had their public debt below 60%. But still, those two countries, Hungary and, and Croatia, are much higher. Yes, it is true, we had pandemic, situation is different, and technically speaking, the stability and growth pack has been suspended, actually until end of 2023, and still this is something we can discuss. I'm not sure that once that this suspension is over, that we will come back to the same numbers, because already there are discussions that fiscal expansion didn't happen only because of A, pandemic, B, war in Ukraine, but now it's about green transition, it's about digitalization of the economy. You know that Europe has a lot of EU plans of digitalization. So trying to relax fiscal rules wherever they were seems to be very much, very much on the agenda. So this is, I think, something to uh, think about. Now, what does it mean? That, that may be a problem because last week, last week, yeah, I'm sure last week, uh, ECB governing council had a meeting. They only announced they will increase in July interest rates by 0.25%. Some consider it too small, too late, but that's, that's another issue. The point is that immediately what has happened is that the spread between German and Italian bonds started to increase by more than 2%. It was, I think, 2.4% at its peak. Immediately, governing council of uh, ECB had another meeting and announced that they are working on, so it's still in design room, so-called anti-fragmentation uh, measures, so to avoid fragmentation of the European um, transmission mechanism, basically meaning buying additional bonds regardless of the decision to stop with new buying of bonds for Italian, especially Italian, Greek, and probably Spanish bonds. If Italy didn't have a public debt of 150%, uh, I'm sure that this would not have happened. So yes, public debt is an issue. Very briefly, because I know uh, you are not specialist in, in um, monetary operations, and this may not be your, your primary interest, but let me talk what has happened with uh, so-called neutrality in monetary policy, uh, what happened with not buying government bonds. As a consequence, first of the global financial crisis, later on with the pandemic, central banks started, especially advanced central bank, buying enormous amounts of government debt. When I'm talking, they call it unorthodox measures, they call it quantitative easing, but the amount that has happened is absolutely staggering. By this, I mean, I've been looking at central bank balance sheet for a while, and some of uh, you may have missed that ECB, I mean, I'm talking Euro system, combined balance sheet, today is seven and a half times larger than it was in 2006. Almost eight times larger. I'm not talking 8%, I'm not talking 80%, I'm talking eight times larger. Fed's balance sheet, 10 times larger. Look at the numbers, official Fed numbers. So those are 
absolutely amazing. If anybody would have told me before global financial crisis that this was possible, I would say, you are not from this planet. This is absolutely not, not possible to happen. But this is happening. And then when you ask, look, you are buying government bonds, how come this is not financing of government deficits? Official answer from ECB is, we are not doing it on a primary market, we are doing it on a secondary market. Well, we had a lot of criticism when in Croatia we were financing government deficits. And of course, this is not directly monetary financing, but every bank which is on a primary market in the last couple of years knew quite well every bond, government bond, they will buy from Italy, Greece, and so on, will automatically be refinanced by the ECB. So, yes, we may play around. We are working on transition mechanisms, but basically this is government financing, at least in my, in my book, the way I see. Similar for sectoral approach. A lot of people don't realize that until recently, ECB was buying corporate bonds. Corporate bonds, Nestle. So if bankers know that ECB is buying corporate bonds on the secondary market, of course it's favoring Nestle, come on. It's not neutral. Yes, you are doing it for a uh, better transmission mechanism and so on, six or seven companies. The main refinancing operation, it's called targeted long-term refinancing operation, three. And still today, if you make sure and you reinvest it for businesses and consumption, you know what's interest rates on almost unlimited amount of LTLO3 you can get? Minus 1%. Under certain conditions, ECB will still today with inflation of 8% pay you 1% to get the money and invest it for them. So, so much for real interest rates, so much for lack of sectoral neutrality. Anyway, the ECB is not the only one doing corporate bonds buying. Bank of Canada is doing similar things. Fed is doing thing, similar things and so on. Academic views have accordingly changed. I know some of you may be familiar with the policy that became quite familiar in US, modern monetary theory. Uh, I'm not going into the details, but basically it says if you are a sovereign country, you can print your own money or public, the level of public debt doesn't really, doesn't really matter. Even when Trump was president, he tried to put one of the advocates of modern monetary theory onto the Fed. He didn't manage, so we'll see what happens. Macroeconomist Olivier Blanchard, who is one of the most famous macroeconomists in the world, he was chief economist at the, the IMF, he advocates that public debts should be much higher than whatever the criteria criteria were. Uh, Stiglitz view, again, those numbers, 63%, they're all artificial. But for me, what most, most interesting in the last couple of years, even the institution, which was the beacon of uh, being fiscally conservative, IMF started saying to countries, you should spend more. You should spend more. So if you just compare what they did in the crisis 97 in Asia, when they were kind of squeezing fiscal deficits, today, the main, I'm not saying official, but certainly even the deputy managing director, Gita Gopinath, who was formerly chief economist at the fund, they're all putting blogs, yes, you should spend more, yes, this is because of the pandemic, yes, this is because of the war, but still we have an issue where the IMF is pushing for more fiscal expansion. Let me now make a brief digression, which I think is important at this point because we can easily say, uh, well, situation uh, requests that we spend more money and this is how the world was safe from recession in the pandemic and so on. There was a famous quote from Keynes. Uh, journalists were, were, were joking with Keynes. Well, Mr. Keynes, you very frequently change your opinion. How come you, you, you are not consistent in your views? And he answered something like this. Well, I change my opinion as information I have changed. And what do you do, sir? So in a way, yes, situation is different. But the point I'm trying to make here, my second digression is about asymmetries. I think we often forget about asymmetries generally in life and especially in economic policymaking. 
When I refer to life, let me use two of my private examples. First, number one, in my 65 years, I have learned that it's very easy to gain weight, extremely difficult to lose it. It's just asymmetrical. And when you decide to lose weight, it's just a completely different effort when the weight goes on. Second example in my life is marriage. Very easy to get marriage, but getting divorced, <laughs> believe me, it's quite messy. <laughs> on a more serious note, similar things are happening in economics. Uh, fiscal expansion, when you extend uh, subsidies, when you try to stimulate some areas of the economy are quite easy. When you try to withdraw subsidies, which are given, fiscal expansion, then you enter into the completely different area of political economy of reforms and asymmetries. It is very difficult to withdraw. It's not the same. So if you say to countries, spend more money, you have fiscal space, your public debt can be 90%, nothing will happen. If you want to go back, it doesn't, I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's much more difficult than in this, this way. And especially if political economy of reform teaches us, if you have some elections in between, so the finance minister has to think about that area, he won't, he won't easily withdraw subsidies, which, another, which we are all agreed. Inflation, I already told you the number for EU, or Eurozone. Uh, what's interesting, US inflation in May, 8.6%. Recently, we were told, oh, no, inflation will go back to 2% in a couple of months. This is Fed talking a couple of months ago. Now they raise interest rate by 0.75%, two times in a row. Uh, UK, let me read what the Bank of England still has officially on its website. I just saw it two days ago. We are responsible for keeping inflation low and stable. The government has set up a target of keeping inflation at 2%. Reality in May, 9% inflation in UK. That's the number. And even the website says by the quarter, fourth quarter, we will probably have 11% inflation. I guess that's why trains are not running today, because this is what I'm speculating. What we see is the beginning of price wage spiral industrial action being created by inflation. So, so much for anchored inflationary expectations and so much for people expecting that next month inflation will go away. It won't, it's a problem. Anyway, um, I remember uh, when I talk about Bank of England, I had the privilege to meet uh, one of the governors, uh, the late Baron Eddie George. And Eddie George was known to be a chain smoker. And yes, you could smoke at that time at Bank of England in his room. I know today it doesn't sound. And he would say all the time, central banks have only one mantra, price stability, price stability, price stability. This is reflected on the website of the Bank of England. But in reality, I'm not sure this is how the world looks like. My point here is inflation is way above target. Central banks are still a little bit <clears throat> at loss of how to control it. What I'm saying here is that the world we live today is very different than the one when transition started, if you remember, in the 90s. It's simply a different economic environment. And this is, uh, for me, the question, and I'm going to the second part of my speech, where do we go from here? I have a lot of questions, where do we go from here? I'm not sure I have so many answers. But the truth is that macroeconomic standards that we were all accustomed to, Maastricht criteria were probably the first macroeconomic standards that were not universally accepted, but at least in this part of the world, people would agree what inflation means, public debt, and so on. Those things obviously are not active uh, anymore. We won't go back to the what I called old normal situation for different reasons. Uh, it was mentioned, uh, yeah, uh, now I mentioned, thank you, that I'm very proud Croatia will become member of the Eurozone on January 1st, 23, so in less than six months' time. But you know what? We will become a member of the Eurozone, meeting Maastricht criteria with 88% of public debt, and inflation last month was 
I guess you can say beauty is in the eye of a beholder, but the convergence report that was issued a month before, on June the 1st actually, says that we are on the right path to it. So I'm very happy that we are joining uh, Eurozone, but if you told me this a couple of years ago, I certainly wouldn't believe that one can become, become members. So where do we go from here? There is this old saying, if you don't know where you are going, every way will leave you, will leave you there. The problem with loss of macroeconomic uh, standards, and I don't think we can still believe in those that were at the beginning of transition, it's a little bit because, uh, it's, for example, one, one case from, from a medical, medical case. If you go to your GP, most probably your GP will tell you the following. You should eat less, especially everything that is tasty, meaning fatty and salty or sugary, uh, exercise more, drink with moderation, and by all means, don't smoke, okay? And that is a standard practice. We all know the story. Now, just imagine him showing one day at your GP office, and he tells you, oh, you look a little bit anxious. Why didn't you get that pack of cigarettes? And by the way, bottle of Merlot at night, it's very good for your heart. You will be surprised because it's completely opposite for what is going on in what he was telling you maybe a year before. But this is... Of course, not to the extreme, I'm, I'm just trying to make my point. This is what is happening in the economy. We still say central banks should pursue stable prices and having 2% inflation, and we have four or five times that number. So how do you address that question toward the transition economies, not just those that are in either Eurozone or outside? Should, should advanced economies in Europe tell them, well, you know, you, like, like, you know, the father, father who smokes, don't do as I do, do as I tell you. So is this advice still valid or should we address those questions in a different, in a different way? Um, I'm not sure that the answer is simple because there is no simple answer at that point. And certainly to make things more complicated, the situation which we are talking about is not only uh, in economic terms. I'm not going into that area, but definitely the war in Ukraine has added the geopolitical dimension to the whole story. Of course, I'm all for the candidacy status of Ukraine, probably Georgia and Moldova, but of course this is a political decision, or if you want geopolitical, geostrategic decision. This is not an economic decision at least the way I see uh, countries like um, Macedonia even changed its name, for God's sake, to North Macedonia a couple of years ago in Albania to be able to start negotiating. And then you had President Macron saying, well, maybe it's not time because we need first, you may remember that, internal reform and then we'll do. That was a big blow to, to those candidates. And Actually, we still have two potential candidate countries. These are Bosnia-Herzegovina and Kosovo with non-degree. Non Before I end my conversation, let me just say again a couple of personal experiences why I still think that in spite of all those issues which I described, EU is the way to go. Not just that the European Union is the highest quality of life on Earth, and I'm sure it will remain for a long time, but how it did help us Croatia the way I see it. Point number one, legal framework and EU rules. Especially, it, I think, to a large degree, it limited the discussions we would otherwise internally have in Croatia. I always remember a, a saying by, by Paul Krugman, who wrote in one of his blogs that when he spoke uh, with an um, economist in the public sector and he said, look, what is your role uh, as, as an experienced policymaker? And he said, basically, my main task throughout my career was fighting bad economic ideas. Unfortunately, bad economic ideas like cockroaches. You flush them down the toilet, sooner or later they come back. So in a way, EU rules helped narrow discussion about bad economic ideas, and I'm very, very pleased about that. Second is we heard yesterday, actually, two lectures to, to uh, one keynote and, and the presentation about corruption. Uh, 
Croatia is, like a lot of countries in that region, uh, I would say rather highly corrupt country. And uh, when I say EU has decreased corruption, let me give you um, another example. We are getting a lot of money from EU. But in EU, there is something called OLAF, which is anti-corruption unit to see whether the money from EU has been mismanaged. And OLAF recently opened an office in Zagreb. And for the first time, uh, that was last year, an acting minister was arrested and put into jail because of suspicion of corruption, not because Croatian courts, in, or we have this, uh, I'm, I'm not a legal expert, but whoever it, prosecution or, or anti-corruption office did, but OLAF, international agency from EU, they put in charge and that minister was, it's the, of course, she's out of the government. I'm sure were it not for the OLAF that that person would probably remain minister because politically it doesn't really sound good if police comes and arrests you, an active minister. But that's due to EU. Without EU, that would not happen. Point number two, which helped Croatia a lot, is the question of state aid or subsidies. I think you guys would call that rent-seeking. I call it political blackmail. Shipyards in Croatia were never profitable. Not, neither in Yugoslavia, nor in Croatia, never ever. They always had very huge subsidies. Nobody had the guts to decrease them because shipyard workers, trade unions, they would fight before the elections. State aid rules said, guys, if you want to enter EU, no more state aid. And I'm talking billions, and I'm very grateful for this. Finally, with EU, we managed to get financial integration. We became part of the banking union, and recent banking, uh, I as governor had unfortunate um, um, situation that we had a banking crisis and I have blood on my hands, believe it or not, I had to close down 22 banks, which as you may imagine was not the best, the best option. Uh, we had deposit insurance, but a lot of people were left without money. However, the last crisis because of Russian sanctions, we had Sberbank was resolved with, uh, within the resolution framework of EU without involvement of taxpayers' money. That's one of the big benefits when you are part of the, of the broader, broader community, banking supervision as well, and so on. So that's the third example, and I will stop there <coughs> because of the time. Just give me five more minutes. Uh, but certainly those are benefits, and therefore I would certainly recommend to all countries in the region to continue their pursuit of the EU integration. In conclusion, again, a little bit of history. 22 years ago, I had the privilege to deliver a so-called Jacques de la Rosière lecture at the EBRD annual meeting. It was about 10 years after the transition started, and I entitled it, It's All About People. Basically, the way I believe it is that economic reforms that we knew should be only those, not only should be those that benefit people. Don't worry, I'm not a populist. Populism is quite popular, and I don't want to sound popular, but if you think, we shouldn't make economic reforms for the sake of reforms, of, for some academic criteria. We should make them if we believe this will make in the medium term, not immediately, not all of them better. As I told you, closing down banks had a lot of negative consequences on GDP, but I thought that that was the only way, not me personally, but the bank, to resolve, to resolve problems. My strong belief is that policymakers should do what benefits, benefits people. And then, therefore, I closed and I said that depends to a large degree on how each country sees its own benefits. I closed the, this speech, and I have, otherwise you would accuse me of auto um, um, plagiarism. The same quote that was used in that speech, and let me, let me say it now, I quoted French philosopher Nicolas Chamfort, first in French, le bonheur n'est pas chose aisée. Il est très difficile de le trouver en nous, et impossible de le trouver ailleurs. In English, that means happiness is not easy to find. It's very difficult to find it in yourself, but it is impossible to find it elsewhere. 
Applied to transition economies, basically, in my view, it means that the benefit for each country ultimately lies within that country. It was true 22 years ago, and I think, I believe it's true now. Every transition economy has to look within themselves. Of course, joining EU is extremely beneficial. Of course, you should look and aim for it. But the ultimate uh, success or not success depend, and I would say not even so much what we think is good, but what we really feel in our hearts. We must decide what is good for our faith. No bureaucrat in Brussels or technocrat in ECB can tell us what to do. Yes, we can listen to them, but at the end, if we don't really believe in what we do, it won't be a long-term long -term success. True, we get a lot of money from the EU, but it's not just about money, it's about values, it's about how we want our children, what type of society to live in. Finally, as this conference is taking place in post-Brexit Britain, and I understand there are a lot of tensions between Northern Ireland Protocol over the channel, I thought it may not be appropriate that my last words are from a French philosopher, so I decided to quote William Shakespeare. <laughs> and believe it or not, today it's Midsummer. So I won't quote from Midsummer Night Dream, but from Julius Caesar. And the quote is as follows, applied to transition economies. The fourth dear Brutus is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marco. Let me uh, give a round of applause, please. All right. Um, I think I'd like to open the floor uh, to to questions and uh, comments and reactions, please. Thank you, Marco, for the fascinating uh, uh, presentation. So you started out your talk uh, outlining the main tenets of the Washington uh, consensus, and I think you gave a very interesting uh, account of how this consensus became eroded <laughs> after the, uh, uh, the GFC, certainly in the, in the world of monetary policy with quantitative easing and what may be called maybe dragonomics uh, uh, <laughs> as well. Um, so that made me think about an event that took place in this country last year, uh, that the G7 meeting. And in the aftermath of that meeting, the Financial Times came up with this term that I thought would catch on, and then it didn't, but I thought it was quite an appropriate idea. And that was the Cornwall consensus. The G7 took place in, mm -hmm. in Cornwall. And I thought that that, uh, that term kind of captured appropriately kind of a change in zeitgeist uh, following the erosion of the uh, uh, of the Washington consensus and in general the economic policy world has shifted has come a long way since the Washington consensus with a greater focus on the role of the state in uh, governing supply chains uh, producing public goods investing in public goods such as vaccines um, uh, in, in during, during the COVID pandemic. So I'm thinking, what is the future of the monetary policy component of the, um, what we could call the, the Cornwall consensus, mm -hmm. especially in the, in the Eurozone and in the, uh, in the Western Balkans region? So <clears throat> that's, that's one question. And the other one is, what will happen in your view with inflation uh, in, the next, uh, uh, in the next few months? Um, will these interventions that the Fed and uh, 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 belatedly the ECB have announced, will they have an effect on this spiraling dynamic of inflation in a context where inflation is being driven primarily by a supply shock rather than excessive aggregate demand? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Marco. Thanks, Eric. Great survey, really enjoyed that. Um, just going back to your initial comment about sort of your massive when the transition happened, and if it had happened 20 years earlier before Thatcher and Reagan, things would have looked different. Um, that's there the emphasis on macro policy. There was also a big change in, in trade policy view, which happened in the 1980s. This was kind of replacing input substitution, industrialization mm -hmm. by um, more. Uh, 
exploit oriented, you know, make it easy to get inputs at the cheapest price. I really want to mention this because my second acquaintance with Ole Evolution was his work in the 1980s, which was on precisely this area. He wrote about South South trade and North South trade. And that's part of his huge impact of academic economists on policymaking, I think. So we moved to uh, opening up to trade. This has been a really difficult thing to convince governments. Uh, it, you know, that they should join the WTO, for example. Yeah. That's if that meant for the European, but for the uh, former Soviet Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you, when you think about this, in terms of when we talk about moving towards more government intervention, what areas do we think that should happen? And to me, trade is one where I think it shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And your Croatia is bought into that because you don't even have your own trade policy. Now, yeah. but, EU, EU policy, but it's, it's always been an issue, sort of countries like Azerbaijan, the government says, well, we don't know where people come what our trade policy should be, but, yeah, an open trade policy is good for these countries. Mm -hmm. So, um, just that, so my question really is, to what extent do you think this issue of moving away from the Washington consensus <laughs> is good on every part of the Washington consensus, mm -hmm. or some parts it's more valid than others? Okay. Thank you. Um, you uh, you ended your talk uh, by saying that uh, you know policy should be for the benefit of the people, mm -hmm. uh, and I and, and I wanted to ask you for your thoughts about um, uh, sort of convergence and social policy at the EU level. Uh, so to give an example, one of the uh, you know one of the sort of pillars of social policy, uh, you know, the poverty rate uh, as as you know as calculated by. Eurostat is, is a relative poverty rate. Uh, and so the latest figures would tell you that the poverty rate in Luxembourg is 17.5% and the poverty rate in Slovakia is 11%. <laughs> um, and of course, this is partly because the poverty threshold in Luxembourg uh, is you know, four, four and a half times the, that of Slovakia. And you know, surely there's you know, differences, massive differences in cost of living, but the question is, is, is some of the, you know, there's a lot of convergence in poverty rates, uh, if you just look at the that numbers, and I wonder if, you know, if, if, uh, if a lot of this is uh, artificial, and, and, if, uh, and if sort of uh, social disparities uh, sort of within the EU writ large uh, should be given more prominence, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what are the political repercussions of that? Okay. Thank you. Okay, let me try try to, to take question. Um, first, Lucas, two questions. Let me start with another one. <clears throat> with the second one, I'm sorry. Uh, inflation. <clears throat> um, there is an old saying that uh, one should avoid making any forecast, especially about the future. So I'm not sure whatever I say that will make make sense. But my sense from the last couple of uh, couple of months and from reading initially when actually inflation started to pick up already in 2021, yeah, not 2001, 2021, and was picking up gradually, not just, and actually what was added up with the war in Ukraine and uh, energy food prices that was in the last couple of months because it, it came after, of course, February 24th uh, this year, that initially <clears throat> when inflation went above 2%, I'm talking before Ukraine, most central banks, I'm talking ECB, if you listen, if you read what uh, Philip Lane, chief economist or, or main economist of the ECB, even the Fed rhetoric and so on were, oh, this is a temporary blip. And because monetary policy worked with time lags, as I tried to describe, uh, uh, describe, we should not raise interest rate now because once the interest rate increase kicks in, which will be probably in a year, some say 18 months, inflation will already be over. Now, the excuse now is, well, that would have happened were it not for the Ukraine war. I'm not so sure. As well, I'm not so convinced that inflation, and I'm not just talking about Euro, can be addressed only from the supply side. There was the massive increase in demand in the US with Joe Biden's program. It not just built back, better, built back better, which didn't pass, but if I'm not mistaken, we are talking 19 trillion in the already economy that was started to heat it up. So people would say that to, on the world scale, uh, 
aggregate demand has been driven by U.S. extremely expansionary fiscal policy in the area where already there was heating up. So <clears throat> what does it mean for inflation? Uh, my view is that uh, central banks are a little bit, not a little bit, they are behind the curve. Uh, because exactly all those time lags. And I understand because the logic has changed. <clears throat> As I say, in my time, uh, inflation was the only goal of the central banks, okay? And uh, if you would raise interest rates, that would be in anticipation of possible future inflation. That's why it's called inflation, some would say future inflation targeting. However, Today, central banks, and it will take me a long time to explain all of this, have a lot of additional area, especially after the global financial crisis. Financial stability, now think greening of the economies, greening of the finance. Uh, IMF is talking about gender strategy. <clears throat> I mentioned ecology, uh, income inequality. So, um, Sir Mervyn King, who was, again, Bank of England governor, he would say that central banks have a big risk of overpromise and underdeliver. A lot of things have been done. And I'm afraid, I'm telling you this, because uh, that they lost sight, they don't know where the ball is, and that's inflation. And already inflation is picking up and it's going to be much more difficult what to do now, because as it is post-pandemic world, basically whatever central banks do are doomed. If they raise interest rates rapidly, they will be accused of moving into recession. If they don't, they will end up with high inflation and they will lose credibility because what is, what is their credibility if you know, they can't, can't fight inflation? Which actually reminds me of, a, <clears throat> of an old joke. An Englishman is lost in the countryside and he tries to find his way. So he asks a peasant, uh, how could I go there? So the peasant tries to explain one way, another, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't manage, so in the end, he tells him, look, if I wanted to go to London, I definitely would not start from here. The point is that if I, <laughs> I wouldn't like to be governor today, because you are basically between a rock and a hard place. And I think what central banks will try to do, and I guess that may answer your second question, is they will try to find the middle way. That's what, for example, ECB is trying to do, between hawks and, and, and doves, to find a way uh, walking a tightrope, so not to uh, screw the economy, <laughs> to, to go back to, to our previous lecture, too much by raising rapid interest rates, however, trying to send signals that we will do that. I'm afraid that we, in the next couple of years, we will probably be inflation, I'm not saying double digit, but definitely far above the target. ECB may not reach 2%, probably in the next, I'm just guessing, two or three years. So that's about it. In changes in monetary policy, <clears throat> uh, uh, I'm afraid that, uh, to be honest, I'm not familiar with the Cornwall consensus, so I can't directly discuss. Uh, I miss that, obviously. Uh, I, I cannot directly discuss that. But my views are that, as I, there is a reason why I quoted Sir Mervyn King, is central banks were given because they became very powerful. They became the name of the game after the global financial crisis. Uh, the, only, the only game in town, actually, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, a lot of tasks were given to them and they were very proud. I said, look, balance sheet means basically money, as you know, base money is, is central bank balance sheet. It went up 10 times and we don't have inflation. Well, because it went to assets. That's why you had crypto. That's why you had assets going on. I'm just simplifying Paul. I know he is looking at me. That's why interest rates started to rise. What has happened with crypto? Bitcoin is at 17,000. It was 69%, 69,000 in November last year. With the rise in interest rate, crypto crashed. People didn't know where to put money. Real negative interest rates, okay? And what do you do with money? So the answer is, I really think we are in a period of, uh, to quote Goodhart, confused interregnum. There is going to be serious thinking about how to proceed. And I'm not sure the way forward is to give more tasks to the central bank. Because their rhetoric actually was uh, when inflation started. Well, you know, we really can't control inflation. They could, they could when inflation was low. Now they, there is a rhetoric, well, we, we have to look, you have to exclude 
uh, energy prices, volatility prices, and focus on what is called core inflation. But consumers don't care about core inflation. Consumers care about what their inflation is. So the issue is that unless I think they should slim down in terms of focus, focus on what they do best, and this is refocus financial stability, of course, but certainly the prices. So that, that's about Cornwall, the, the best I can do. Um, on Washington consensus, that was a question. Um, regarding, I don't know, uh, regarding EU, uh, what I think is, uh, I will, I will uh, answer indirectly, uh, not just in economic terms. Uh, the world is very polarized. I apologize. I think. The world is very polarized, okay? You have populism versus this, um, anti-vaxxers, uh, those for the vaccines and so on. Um, the way I see, if I may speak very openly, is that the big polar... Um, Europe should focus more on EU on economic values. I know it's on economic issues. Uh, yes, free trade to the extent possible, but certainly not uh, on the capital account. I don't see much point in having short term in and out of capital, but trade as a trade, that, that should certainly be, be beneficial. However, when the supply chains broke down, you know that just in time was replaced by just in case. I, as, as, as the acronym, you know, you need to do that. So, uh, in a way, I think that um, I really don't have a good answer for you. I just think monetary policy needs to be revised. Fiscal numbers have to be revised. We have to work on that and find the, as broad a consensus. And I'm sure it will happen. Because if you look in the longer term, we had consensus on government intervention, then came free trade or, or um, Washington consensus. Then again, this is a reaction, as Vito was saying, to too much market, it's much more government. Social policies. Um, uh, I think uh, the only thing which I started to say, and let, let me rephrase, is that um, pushing too much, um, it's not Convergence in terms of having the same level in EU will not happen anytime soon. So what I think Europe should be well advised to see what is the common ground that most countries can, can adopt, not to push for other values too much. If you look at US, and that's what I wanted to say openly in this conference, what are the main divisions, for example, in US politically? It's gay rights and abortion rights. This is what divides the country. People are even not talking so much about purchasing power. What is happening in EU? Poland, conservative Catholic countries, we heard about that, have more, they don't have so much complaint about regional policies or, or those things, but those values. So one should not push on countries if they cannot, especially transition economies, if they cannot accept those values as soon as possible. Be more gentle, be more slowly, find what unites us and not what, what divides countries. I'm, I'm not, I know it's not, I'm sorry, you're here. It's not the best answer, but I think I've taken enough of your time, so that would be for my side. Nora, if you want to come back. All right, well, thank you. I'm, I, I, I was not sure if there was one more question from the floor, but if there are no more questions, I'd like to Again, thank you, Marco, very much for the very insightful presentation. I'm sure uh, there'll be a lot of more informal discussion following this. Uh, and I would like to invite the audience for a final round of applause.